is Jamie Morgan Besser from the Australian Red Cross National Recovery Team. And thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. Anne Ledbetter, Local Government and Community Led Recovery. Uh, I wish to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now today's webinar is being presented by Australian Red Cross. Red Cross Reco Recovery Program is based upon the Australian National Disaster Recovery Principles and draws upon the Community Recovery Handbook, research from the Beyond Bushfires Research Program, as well as our own domestic and international experience. It also contributes to the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction with a focus on building back better. Red Cross has been supporting the recovery of rural, regional, urban and Indigenous Australian communities post-disaster since 2006. Australian Red Cross disaster recovery programs are all hazard, consequence focused and work closely with local services, all levels of government and community groups. As a result of this community-led approach, all our recovery programs are reflective of the communities we work with. Red Cross adds value to recovery processes through having a trusted, neutral, independent role within communities that draws upon our unique national and international network of expertise, including other Red Cross national societies, academia, business and community organisations. Now, following the 2019-2020 bushfires, Red Cross has committed to a three-year recovery program across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. Now, before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I just have a, a few housekeeping topics. Now, today's webinar is being recorded and we will share the link to the recording with you after the event is complete. It'll be uploaded to the Australian Red Cross YouTube channel under our Disaster Recovery Webinar Series. We, we welcome you to revisit the content and also share it with your network. We also invite your comments and questions and please look at the Q&A chat box at your screen and uh, the chat function. Now if you think of a question for Anne at any point, uh, please type it in there and I will either pose it to her at the time or hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the event. Now today we are joined, we're very, very lucky to be joined by Anne Ledbeater. After the extreme Victorian bushfire events of 2009, when 173 people died and thousands of properties were destroyed, and worked on behalf of council to coordinate the initial recovery efforts for the King, Ra King Lake Rangers community. The recovery model that was developed was subsequently highlighted as a case study in the final report of the Victorian Bushfires Royal Commission. Since then, Anne has been awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for her work in the aftermath of the 2009 Victorian bushfires and has worked with communities recovering from drought, fire, flood, cyclone and earthquake across Australia and New Zealand. So we welcome Anne today and please feel free to take it away Anne. Okay thank you so much Jamie and thank you everyone for taking the time to, to join this um, webinar. Lovely to see some familiar faces in the um, in the names popping up and and also welcome to people who um, perhaps we haven't um, had the chance to meet. So um, some of you might have heard uh, me present before and I have to say there's only a certain number of ways that we can we can cut this up. So some of this may be familiar to you. Um, for some people who are working in recovery, hopefully what we talk about today will actually help to um, consolidate and reaffirm some of the great work that you're already doing. Um, and for some people who perhaps haven't had that experience, you know, some tips and, and, and insights into how we can support communities uh, to lead their, their own recovery. Now I have a PowerPoint presentation which I'm going to step through as, as Jamie mentioned um, and Hopefully that will give us some different ways to think about community-led recovery and, and to operationalise that work. So I'm going to um, just share my screen. Um, uh, okay, so we've got a little problem there, Jamie, in that uh, screen sharing has been disabled. Let me fix that for you immediately, Anne. Bear with me Thank just you. a moment. How's that, Anne? Can you try there? Uh, no, still disabled. Okay. Don't you love it? This is just the, this is the realism of it all. <laughs> <laughs> Give me two moments while I just quickly fix that one up. Thank you so much. Okay.
There we go, Anne. You should Perfect. be able to share. Yeah. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you. Okay. And so, um, there we go. So hopefully now you're all seeing that uh, that opening slide. And the thing that I want to talk about today is uh, is just as I said, a slightly different way of maybe thinking about and and operationalising this idea of community lead recovery. Um, uh, it, it can be quite a challenging concept when, particularly when we're working with um, government agencies or in local government, um, to to work out how we can support communities to lead their own recovery, that we have a lot of responsibilities ourselves and, uh, and things that we need to deliver against and, and, you know, and report on and be accountable for. How do we sort of create that space for, for communities to actually take the lead? So, so this idea hopefully will, will give us some, some different ways of thinking about that. Um, I think what we know about communities, particularly working in local government, I, I worked in council for 16 years, and so um, I, I always loved um, the, the breadth and the complexity of, of the work that councils do. It's my favourite level of government. Um, and, and council um, officers particularly have a really good and nuanced and detailed understanding of the communities they work with. And we understand their complexity. We recognise all of the differences and the, and, and the common um, ground that the community share. Um, we have quite a, a complex understanding of, of the way they're made up and, and how they work, how they operate. But sometimes after a disaster, our perception of community changes. And that is, um, we tend to perhaps think in a much more one-dimensional way about communities and we can even start to define them by the disaster that they've experienced rather than remembering all of the things that we knew about them before. Uh, and that can, that can tend to shape the way we approach uh, the work of recovery. So um, I'd like for us to be able to um, hold a different view and to maintain a different approach uh, in this work. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about emergency management planning more generally, uh, and then a concept uh, that I'm calling community continuity, which I have um, spoken about uh, a little bit in the last sort of 18 months or so. And in order to um, bring that to life, I want to make reference to the research of the fabulous Professor Enrico Quarantelli and Dr. Russell Dines, um, both sadly no longer with us, but um, absolute um, pillars of the, of the social um, disaster research uh, field from uh, from previous years and and some of their research which uh, they were doing back in the 1970s which I promise you is as fresh and relevant today as it was uh, back then. So as uh, as Jamie mentioned um, the reason I guess that I get to sit and speak with you today is uh, as a result of uh, of my own community's experience of disaster back in 2009 um, where in our King Lake Ranges we um, lost 747 homes and, uh, and 46 uh, members of our community who perished in the fires. And, and that um, experience uh, and the way that that experience intersected with my work in local government sort of set me on a bit of a quest to work out how recovery should happen, um, what sort of things um, support it to happen well and, and what things get in the way. And so since Black Saturday, uh, I have had the chance to work with recovering communities uh, around Australia and, and to do some policy development and research. Um, I finished, finished a, a master's degree and the second part of that was very much focused on, on this concept of the role of community leadership uh, in, in disasters. Um, I had um, the opportunity to uh, oversee the rewrite of the, of the Community Recovery Handbook um, in 2018. Um, and also to develop a handbook on uh, spontaneous volunteering uh, in emergencies. Um, I wrote uh, a national strategy on spontaneous volunteering for, uh, for the federal government. So lots of opportunities to think uh, quite deeply, I guess, about the way recovery works and, um, and, and how we need to um, understand uh, our role um, within that. Um, and, and, an, and a chance, I guess, to develop a few pet theories as well, which I know some of you have heard. So I hope you'll indulge me as I touch on those again. So um, I think you need to understand first and foremost about disaster recovery uh, and disasters more generally is that they are about people. 
So we really need to keep the idea of the centrality of people and the effect on people um, in our work. Um, we get very invested in, in, uh, in Australia and in, and in lots of um, developed countries about uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so we have a big focus on fixing the things that are broken. And that's important work to do, of course, but it's only important because those things matter to people. Uh, and they and they are um, uh, you know, directly in, um, connected to the lives and livelihoods of the people that we're trying to support. So people um, are at the centre and uh, need to be at the centre of, of everything that we do. Now, um, the more of this work that I've been involved in, the more convinced I am that in lots of ways, it doesn't actually matter what the disaster is, um, whether it's a fire or a flood or a storm or you know, earthquake, um, cyclone, we don't actually get to choose um, what happens. We don't actually get to choose where it happens, how severe it is, how long it lasts, how many people are impacted. All of that is outside of our control. Um, and, and certainly the disaster that's uh, unfolding at the moment with the COVID-19 virus, you know, we, we can't decide um, how that unfolds or what happens and, and how it happens. We've just got to be able to um, to respond and, and, uh, and, and manage the, the consequences of that. So the disaster is on the one hand, um, and that's something that you know, we can't influence, but what we can influence, what we can absolutely make a huge difference in is everything that comes after the disaster. Um, the, the work of recovery uh, is, is so vital in terms of supporting people to regain control of their lives because the effect of the disaster is a loss of control over your life and the work of recovery is about helping people to regain that control. Um, and this, I have to say, is if absolutely local government's wheelhouse. Because of the nature of the relationships with community, the nature of the work that local government does ordinarily in, in supporting communities and building their resilience, um, recovery work is such a logical fit. Um, and such a huge opportunity for local government to make um, an important difference to the lives of the people within their communities. Uh, of the type of disaster, what we know is that the impacts can be remarkably similar for people. And that is you try and imagine what happens in the next part of your life, how your life works now after this terrible thing that's occurred. And there's nothing there. You know, you're off the map in terms of your lived experience uh, and you're having to try and forge a path into a very uncertain future and so it is for all of us at the moment um, with, with COVID-19. None of us really know what's going to happen next and so we're just feeling our way and trying to you know to find that, that, that path into the future that we need. Um, and that is true of people who are directly and indirectly affected by this disaster. It's also true of people who are working in response and recovery. We're all in this together and, and that sense of uncertainty about the future is, is common to us all. Now, we have lots of legislation and arrangements and um, uh, standard operating procedures and, and policies, etc., that that we apply uh, to emergency management with good effect. And most people who've um, been you know, working in Australia in, in, in emergencies uh, in the last dec decade or so would be familiar with the PPRR um, spectrum or continuum or model. Um, and with PPRR standing for prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. And, and it's very often presented uh, as, a, as a sort of a linear process um, comprising of separate areas of focus and it's a great way to divide up the work and the expertise uh, and to make sure that you know that we don't miss uh, any of these critical parts of, of the overall um, recovery or the overall emergency management system. Um, I have to say that I think we, we do um, prevention and preparedness you know reasonably well. Um, we do response very very well indeed um, in Australia but I think um, recovery has probably languished a bit in terms of the focus and the intention that it serves. Um, and so we're not as far developed as we could be in terms of actually planning for recovery. Um, and as Red Cross um, speaks about, you know, planning to recover, what will that look like? Um, and how will your life work um, after disaster? So this is a real um, challenge, but it's also a, an important opportunity for us. Um, and I think 
the thing that we really need to think about, um, and I get a bit of pushback about this from some quarters of the emergency management sector, but, but what if recovery is actually the main game? What if it's the most important part of that spectrum? So far from being the bit that we just let happen uh, at the end after we put our fire trucks and our flood boats away and our helicopters um, you know, back in their hangars, what if recovery is actually the most important bit? Um, and that how we need to perhaps understand this spectrum is that prevention, preparedness and response are actually about getting ready to recover and mitigating the, uh, the challenges and the impacts of people in this recovery phase. Because <clears throat> a bad day at the office in terms of response might be a few weeks. Um, very commonly, it might be a few days or even you know, a couple of hours. Um, but people are going to be in recovery for months and years. And so I think we really have a, you know, a good case to be putting much more focus into this part of the spectrum. Uh, now to um, uh, cite our um, research uh, fellows, uh, Dons and Quarantelli, they talk about emergency planning as containing um, you know, specific activities and, and areas of focus. So first of all, we need to recognise the threat that the community might be uh, vulnerable to. We need to anticipate the probable effects of that threat. So what would happen if, uh, you know, if there was a, a disaster event? Then we need to identify countermeasures to either neutralise or mitigate the impact of, of, those, uh, of those effects. And then we, um, we mobilise uh, people and resources so that we can um, undertake that work. So the purpose of all of this, according to our researchers, is to enable an effective and an efficient start towards the restoration of normal routines. So in other words, we do all of this to support what needs to happen in recovery. So how do we plan to recover? Well, I think um, contemporary um, business management gives us a really good insight into how we can better understand um, community-led recovery. So most people would be familiar with the concept of business continuity, and that is uh, how we plan for our businesses or our agencies or our departments or our teams to be able to, con to, con to continue to deliver our, uh, our responsibilities, discharge our responsibilities and, and deliver our services um, after um, a significant disruption. And the way that we think about that is what will we need on the first day, the first week, the first month post impact in order to continue to do the work that we need to do. So I think we can um, think about business continuity and we can actually apply that to the concept of community continuity. So what does this community need? What will this community need to be able to get back into the business of being its community? Now, this enables us to think a bit differently about the PPRR spectrum. And, and I think this is a better way for us to understand this work. So everything that we do to prepare to prevent, to respond and to recover um, from disasters is in service of supporting community continuity. And it occurs within the context that's relevant and specific for the communities. So um, if you are planning with a community that is perhaps um, primarily um, rural, maybe it's a farming community, maybe it's a, a dairy farming community, Community continuity is going to look a particular way for that community and it's going to rely on the restoration of particular things such as um, road access, uh, electricity, water restoration, the things that the, the farmers and, and, uh, uh, and their families rely on in order to be able to milk their cows and, and, and you know, uh, fulfil their, their business. Um, if you're talking about a tourism community, then different things will be um, important and they will need to be prioritised. And that might be restoration of tourism, uh, attractions, accommodation, um, access through airports or road access or rail, you know. So, so we need to really think about what will each community that we work with need um, post-disaster in order to support its continuity. And the other thing we really need to get better at is actually planning for what people are likely to do 
rather than planning for what we would prefer that they do. So, so really um, disengaging ourselves from the myths and the misconceptions about uh, response and recovery and getting much more engaged with, with what's likely to be real. Um, now, I include this picture of an ant's nest um, just to illustrate this point a bit. Um, and some of you will have heard this story before, but um, my confession is as a young, much, much younger person, um, growing up in the bush, there wasn't much to do. And so um, sometimes if I came across an ant's nest that looked a bit like this, I couldn't resist the temptation to give a bit of a stamp on the ground next to the ant nest, just to see, you know, what would happen. And of course, the response is pretty predictable. The ants come pouring out of the nest and they rush about and they bump into each other and it's quite chaotic. Um, antennas waving and you know and and all of this frantic activity um, and it's you know it, it's, it, it looks from an outside perspective as if there's nothing terribly useful happening it's just panic and chaos um, but if you are a bit patient and you wait a bit longer you will see some order emerge from that chaotic environment so um, the ants will return to roll the um, the, the, the security ants will, will fan out with their fiercest um, uh, stance to, to protect the, uh, the nest from any further impact. Um, the, the engineering ants will do a rapid impact assessment to see what damage has been uh, incurred. And, and the social service ants will all go back into the nest to make sure that the, that the babies and the eggs are safe. And so we see um, the ants actually are able to, um, to uh, anticipate and to adapt to that temporary disruption to their system um, and order does emerge from from the chaos um, so I think with the deepest of root to impact the community sometimes we have a lot in common with the ants and that is that sometimes the initial appearance of, of how the community is reacting to an outside uh, person can seem just to be a chaotic and disorganized response. But what is actually happening is that the community is trying to make sense of what's happened. Um, and we are patient and we support that to occur, then order will emerge from, from that chaos. So uh, Dines and Quarantelli have summarized this, this idea. Um, and according to them, community-based recovery me mechanisms can look untidy. Uh, particularly to people who have an expectation for a neat model of bureaucratic efficiency, for everything just to work the way the plan suggests that it should. Um, they can look undependable to people who have little faith in the capacity of members of the community to cope with adversity. But it's not chaos or confusion. It's actually the realistic outcome of the involvement of resources of many segments of the community coming together in the accomplishment of common tasks. So we need to understand what we're looking at and we need to, rather than trying to shut that down or prevent it from occurring, actually support it to happen. So it's important for us if we're gonna be working in a, con in, a, in a concept of community continuity to actually understand the community because it's really difficult to support an entity or, or a way of working when you don't actually understand what is, what's, what's going on and what that looks like. And so I'm very excited to see um, a trend uh, emerging around Australia uh, of the development of community profiles as uh, a strategy for helping to manage emergencies and particularly as a strategy for helping to um, embed and connect with uh, community-led recovery um, post-disaster. So a community profile helps us to understand what con continuity needs to look like. Uh, and the sorts of things we might include in a community profile um, and uh, demographic data, so first and foremost, but not just um, the ABS stat. You know, we need to go beyond that. So we need to understand the demography, but we also need to understand the geography, so environmental uh, and land use data. How is this community um, structured in terms of its land use? We really need to understand what the critical infrastructure is both for that community, but also in terms of the way that infrastructure supports surrounding areas. We need to have an understanding of the economic activities and influences of that community. How does it generate its income? How do its 
people, how are its people supported to survive and thrive in, in that space. Um, peak periods, certain times of the year where we might expect a bit more complexity or um, a bit more um, effort required to manage the impacts of uh, a negative uh, event. So peak periods for tourism, harvesting, um, itinerant workers, etc. What happens in that community across the space of the year that might need to be factored into our understanding. Then we need to get really into the heart and soul uh, of the community. So it's social and community networks and structures. How does it hang together? How does it inter interact um, and how does it relate uh, both within and you know, without to other communities um, within, within the same area? It's culture, it's history and it's heritage. All of these things are vitally important in terms of understanding um, the values and and, and the way that the community needs to be supported. What's its disaster risk profile? What could happen? What are the bad things that could occur? And importantly, what experience has this community had of particular disasters in the past and what lessons have, um, has it been able to, uh, to learn about that? The values and the priorities and the aspirations of the community, what does it care about? What are the common aspirations, the common things that communities are working towards what are the things that people in the community don't agree about? Um, you know, we need to be able to understand those so that when we see our tensions emerging after the disaster, we can recognise them for what they are and whether they are long-standing or whether they've emerged as a consequence of the recent event. And finally, and probably most importantly, we need to have a working understanding of community capacity. So what is this community good at? What is it able to do for itself? Um, what are its vulnerabilities? So the areas where it might need more support and what are the, the strengths that exist within the community? Because if we are going to support community-led recovery, we absolutely need to understand what the community is able to do and what it will actually need help to achieve. Now, ideally, uh, community profiles are actually developed in collaboration with the community. And that's a terrific opportunity to raise the profile of emergency management in, from a preparedness um, perspective, um, but also a great opportunity to build relationships um, with the community and for the community to strengthen its existing relationships um, for different organisations and groups to learn more about what each other does, um, what each other's capacity might look like and, and what some of the challenges um, that they might experience uh, could be. So um, that's probably the, the ideal scenario. But even if you don't have the opportunity to do that, even if it's just a desktop exercise just for you, um, I would still absolutely encourage you to have a community profile for the communities that you're working with. Um, there's a temptation to do them at the sort of municipal level, and that kind of feels like a, an efficient way to go. But the reality is that there's such variation between communities in one local government area that your profile will be less useful than if it's actually right at the sort of self-identified grassroots community level. Um, and the important um, benefit of having uh, this sort of a resource or a document is that if you do have a disaster and lots of people come from outside of your area to help, you can share that information with them straight away um, so that they can go into your communities and have uh, that same um, exposure to an experience of the way the community was before the disaster. Uh, and that's going to help um, to facilitate recovery and certainly to support community-led recovery. So some strategies for community continuity. Um, we can't fly blind. Um, we have to really work to understand the community uh, and we need to recognise that it is messy and it is complex um, and not to be put off by that. To think about looking at our ant's nest and know that there's a whole lot of stuff going on that's really important even though we might not necessarily understand what all of it means. So we've got the opportunity to connect with community um, and again ideally you're doing this in a planning phase before a disaster but even if that's not the case even if you're working with a community after disaster, having some sense of, of the profile and the way the community uh, operated before is going to be really, really critical. 
Um, we need to understand that, that concept of capacity. Um, nothing is more frustrating than having people do stuff for you that you are capable of doing for yourself. And if we think about the work of recovery as helping people regain control, then we really need to understand that concept of community capacity and social capital. We need to have confidence uh, and trust in the community to know what they need, to know what they're going to be able to do, to know what they're going to need help with, and to be willing to give up a bit of control in terms of allowing all of that to, um, to unfold. Um, I hear a lot in disaster recovery uh, and emergency preparedness about shared responsibility. I have to say, I'm not hearing as much about shared control. So, so that's our challenge. Um, it's really hard to expect people to be responsible for something that they don't actually have control over. So we've got to find the balance uh, in that. We need to understand that everyone is affected. Uh, and for those of you who are working with recovering communities right now, I know that you don't need to know this. Um, you're already living the experience uh, of the fact that when a disaster occurs, everyone bears some level of effect for, uh, you know, in relation to that. Um, you don't have to have had flame on your property or flood water through your house to have experienced the effect of disaster. Uh, and so if we can take the attitude that everyone is affected, then we're not going to be presupposing or making assumptions about how people should uh, be feeling or, or how their life should be working. So um, the question that we want to ask people is, how has this disaster affected you? Not were you affected by the flood or the fire or the cyclone? Just assume that there is a level of effect and then work to understand what that looks like for that person. There's an incredible importance um, around equity and transparency. Uh, and that's ironic because disasters are inherently unfair. So, you know, it's not fair that a, that a disaster impacts on one community and not another. It's not fair that one person's you know, house burns down and someone else's um, does not. And so in this inherently unfair environment, um, equity and transparency become very important. Now, when I'm talking about equity, I'm not actually talking about doing the same thing for everyone, um, because what we're trying to do is, is to create equity in, op in the opportunity to recover. Um, we want to try and create an equitable opportunity for everyone to come through the disaster and be able to pick up the threads of their life. And that might mean that we need to do more for some people than others um, because we don't all go into a disaster you know, on a level playing field. And that's why transparency is really important because people may perceive that some people are getting more help than them. And we need to be very transparent about why that is the case. Um, there's a great level of tolerance in communities for um, navigating and, and accepting the, the challenges and the, you know, the seeming inequity of disaster if people have a clear understanding of why a thing is happening uh, a certain way. And so, um, you know, some examples um, could be that uh, there's a level of acceptance that whilst everyone might get an initial um, grant uh, to support their recovery, a second round might be targeted to people who weren't insured. And as long as people understand that that's the, that's the, the basis that, that that work is, um, is, is being done or that's the way, uh, that's why that is happening that way, there's a great deal of acceptance that goes with that. What is really frustrating and what can almost end up feeling like the second disaster is when things continue to be or, or are perceived to be unfair. Now, we are going to do much better in supporting community-led recovery and, and community continuity if we can find and work with the natural leaders in our communities. And again, local government is great at this. State government wishes it was as good at local go as local government in understanding the way communities uh, are made up and, and who's who. Um, who are the enablers? Who are the champions? Who are the people that you consistently come across when great things are happening in communities? You know, who are, who are the people who are able to drive and lead and, um, you know, coalesce all of that energy and uh, enthusiasm and capacity? So 
we need to be able to work with those people. Ideally, we're working with them in preparedness um, in terms of building that community profile and you know, planning for recovery. But even if that's not the case, we certainly need to be identifying them and working with them um, after the disaster. We also in local government know um, our, our two percenters. And, and by that, I mean those 2% of people who take up 98% of the time. So, so, you know, importantly, we also know the people who are going to need extra help um, and extra support to manage the experience that they've had. Um, and perhaps the people um, that we need to, um, you know, to, to manage it in, their, in a recovery sense um, and, and to understand what their uh, motivations and, and, uh, uh, and their input might look like. Now, I don't mind if we talk about restoring, reconnecting, re-establishing, reaffirming, all of those kind of re-words after disaster, but let's not reinvent. Um, let's not actually build things after a disaster that already existed uh, in the community structure. Let's not impose um, processes and um, structures and relationships and committees and, and, and other things that uh, already existed. Um, uh, with, with new versions of, of the same thing because um, if we're trying to support community continuity we want to reconnect with the things that were happening before. Um, it doesn't mean that they won't need to change shape, um, that they might, might need to be expanded in their focus or they might need new people to be uh, engaged uh, and involved but we should start with where the community was before the disaster not reinvent a future for them. Uh, and here's the challenge, you know, to see the community as a resource, not a problem to be managed, to actually look at the community and think, how will they be able to help me do my work? How will the community be able to support me to, um, you know, to support them? Not um, as just a constant sort of drain on my, my energy and, uh, and my effort. And so, again, if we're talking about restoring and regaining control, then we can never do two or do four communities when we can do with. Um, and that's a you know, fundamental um, concept in, in community development. Um, it's particularly relevant, I think, in supporting community lead recovery. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about um, status of grief. Um, and I think this is a really useful thing for particularly local government practitioners to know and understand when we're working uh, with, with disasters, disaster affected communities. Um, we're pretty familiar with this concept uh, for people who've had a, a life altering um, experience, um, such as being bereaved or perhaps uh, a, the end of a relationship or you know, loss of a job. Um, and we've all of us, I think it would be fair to say, we've all of us tried to support someone at some point in our lives who've had an experience like that. And the sort of things that we would say to people in that situation is, you should take some time. You know, just take some time and sit with this for a while. Don't make any big decisions just yet. You know, have, have you be kind to yourself and, and let, let uh, some time go past while you work through what this is going to mean for you. Don't sell the house. The week after your relationship ends. You might feel differently about this in a few months time. And the thing about stages of grief is that I think whole communities go through these stages after a disaster. So um, we have whole communities experiencing these different stages and these different impacts uh, and effects of, of the disaster and the way that it's touched their lives. And the reason that that is particularly challenging, I think, for recovery practitioners is that invariably we will be doing the work of our lives and people will be yelling at us. You know, we will be working as hard as we can and, and, and in the most complex environment that, that we've potentially ever been in. And yet it will still um, not seem like it's enough for many people. And when you're faced with that, it's hard not to become defensive. You know, don't yell at me. I've been here since seven o'clock this morning. Yes, it's very understandable to respond in that way. But the problem with that is that um, people need to be angry. You know, they need to be emotional. They need to be distressed because they're working through the stages of grief. And every time we say to someone, don't be angry and don't be sad, we're actually stalling their recovery journey. 
we're preventing them from doing and experiencing the very thing that they need to do and experience at that time. So we need to understand our role here a little bit differently, and that is not to encourage people not to experience their emotions, but to actually be with them and walk with them while they do. Um, and that is hard, hard work. It's distressing work. Um, we're, we're hardwired to try and cheer people up, you know, make them feel better. But the work of recovery is actually being okay with the fact that for a while people aren't going to feel, um, you know, good at all. They're going to need to, to, to work through these really complex and, and painful and distressing emotions in order to make sense of what's happened. So um, we are then um, needing to understand our, our um, putting people and validating what they're feeling. You know, I understand that you're really angry about this. How can I help you with this next bit? You know, how can I help you get through this next challenge? Um, I, I see that you're very upset and I, and I really want to help you to, to get through the rest of the day. You know, so it's not about saying don't be upset um, or, you know, don't be angry. Um, the other thing I just want to mention briefly um, is, uh, is this idea of, of guilt. Um, guilt is um, a very prevalent emotion in, in disaster recovery. Um, and the thing that we need to know about guilt is that it's not um, necessarily a, a rational emotion. Um, most people have no reason to feel guilty. Um, the disaster is not their fault but they will certainly be experiencing a level of guilt. And we, we can talk about the different types. We certainly had every kind of guilt going on in our community after the 2009 fires. Um, commonly, people felt guilty because they still had their homes um, when other people had lost theirs. Um, in our disaster, because of the um, tremendous uh, loss of life, we also had people who felt guilty because they'd only lost their homes um, when other people had lost um, loved ones and family members. We certainly had small business people who felt guilty uh, about the fact that they were concerned about going broke when other people had lost homes and loved ones. So all of this um, sort of complex layered um, feelings of guilt constrain what people feel they can talk about. It constrains how they feel that they can sort of uh, move through recovery and it even constrains, you know, whether or not they'll ask for help. You know, we hear people saying, no, no, don't worry about me, I'm okay. There's people much worse off than me, you know. So, so it's, it is really a complicating factor. Um, we can't avoid it um, and we shouldn't avoid, we shouldn't encourage people not to experience it because that's what they need to do. But we really need to be focused on not making people feel worse. So if we understand about the likelihood that people will have some um, feelings of guilt, then we'll avoid saying things like, oh, you're so lucky you didn't lose your house. Um, you know, those sorts of well-meaning observations uh, that we might make are just going to weigh very heavily on people because they're not feeling lucky. They're actually feeling guilty. Um, and that observation, you know, can make them feel, feel worse. Um, now, the, the shortcoming, and there is one with this diagram, is it's so neat. You know, it's so tidy, boxes and arrows, you know, just, okay, pull up to the anger and guilt station and do your thing and then get on the train and move on, you know, and, and it would be terrific if that's the way it worked, but it's really nothing like that. Um, and, and it's not um, a sort of in at the top and work through the, the machine and come out at the bottom. It's actually uh, much more of a sort of a, a cycle. Um, and people will move through these emotions and then often they'll go back and re-experience them. Um, and not everyone goes through uh, at the same time. Um, so, so we'll have different people experiencing these emotions at different times um, and sometimes, you know, experiencing them for a considerable period or, or more than once. So remember stages of grief, but when you think about it, try and visualise this. It's a much a representation of disaster recovery um, and your life is full of snakes and ladders and, and some days it really does feel like the roll of the dice as to whether you get you know a really short ladder or a, a really long snake.
Now, um, many of you will be familiar with this um, representation of the of the journey of, of recovery. Um, and uh, it's a really useful way for us to understand what happens for people and for communities in a post-disaster setting. And for those who are working in this space right now, just a reminder of, that, of maybe what's going on for your communities and, and why this work is uh, at times so very challenging. Um, it's, it's a research-based diagram. So some of the language is a bit, a bit challenging, um, but researchers um, do great work, but they sometimes use language that can be a bit confronting um, for people. So apologies for that. But the research um, suggests us that there is a, a fairly predictable journey that people will travel um, uh, as they recover from, from a disaster. And the early phase is, um, you know, it's a bit counterintuitive because it actually can be quite positive. Even though this terrible thing has happened, we typically see a bit of an uptick in people's mood and morale in the early stages. And the researchers have named these stages the heroic phase and the honeymoon. Again, a bit doesn't feel like a honeymoon at any point, any disaster I've been in, but we sort of get what they're what they're talking about. And so the heroic phase is um is characterized by feelings of altruism. So everyone looking after each other. And there's a real focus on family and friends and neighbours in that very early stage post-disaster. And that is quickly followed up by this honeymoon stage. Um, so there's a real sense of shared survival in the community. Everyone is talking about um, what's happened and how people have come through and how lucky people are to have, you know, to manage to have survived. Um, importantly, there's an anticipation of getting all the help you need. So there's a sense in that early stage that whatever help is needed will be there. Um, it's just a matter of time and it will all arrive. And there is also a really strong expectation that, that things will be able to return to normal and that that will happen quite quickly. Um, and the focus in honeymoon phase is on community and outside agencies. Um, now, the researchers tell us that, that that early stage lasts for um, between one and three days. Now, I'm not sure whether, um, you know, the, the time frame has been altered by the way we interact now with social media, etc. I'm not really entirely sure why, but I, I sense that that's actually probably a bit short. And I think that in my experience, it probably is more likely to be about three weeks. So we talk about sort of the weeks of disaster while everything's kind of coming together and, and things are getting a bit organised and, and we've probably got that three weeks um, for things to be reasonably um, positive. Um, then around about the end of three weeks, something very profound seems to happen and, um, and the, the wheels really start to fall off. So um, we, we find people really starting to connect with the enormity of what's happened. Um, the incredibly complex impact that, that the disaster is going to have on their lives. And I think uh, around that time, probably the levels of adrenaline that people had experienced in the immediate aftermath have started to subside. And so they're better able to um, mentally connect with what this disaster is going to mean. And so then we see um, very often quite a, um, a trough that the people will go into. Um, and that is characterised by um, frustrations and, and arguments and disputes with, you know, banks or insurance companies or neighbours or council. Or, and then there's a sense that, that support is being lost or, or packing up and leaving. Um, and then there's that physical impacts of the, the fatigue of having been in high adrenaline for so long and, um, and, and you know, sleep, um, lacking in sleep, etc. So all of that contributes to what is potentially a really difficult um, time. And, and I think this diagram is useful because it reminds us that, you know, even how, regardless of how bad things are, you know, at the very beginning, the reality is that things are very often going to get more difficult before they get easier. And so we can um, plan for this. This is something that we can predict and plan for. Um, now, the researchers, again, are talking about a time frame of between one and three years for this um, this third phase and and I wouldn't dispute that at all. I think it's going to take every bit of that amount of time uh, for people to get to the point where they're able to you know to, to, to live a life that they value again. So so remembering that and, and trying to work out where on that cycle your communities might be. Um, 
if we do recovery work really well, um, we can actually diminish the depth of that trough. Um, we can actually make it less, you know, um, uh, deep and, and less difficult to navigate. If we do recovery work badly, we make the trough deeper. So we actually become the problem rather than supporting, you know, the, the solution. So just being mindful of where we are and how we can, um, how we can uh, influence and, and have uh, a positive impact. Um, important for us to try and maintain a holistic view of, of the community. Um, our work in Australia uh, in emergency management and particularly in recovery tends to be divided up into these four domains um, that deal with the social environment, our economics, the built and the natural environments. And, and our expertise is clustered within those areas of, uh, of focus. Um, and that works really well. Um, providing we don't get so invested in our bit that we forget to lift our head and look at what's happening uh, in the other in the other areas of recovery. So um, we have to be able to support our recovery across this whole system. Uh, if we just focus on buildings, we'll have a whole lot of new buildings, but we won't necessarily have a recovered community. So thinking about um, recovery and the community as a system and recognising that when we do something in one part of the system, there will be a corresponding effect somewhere else. So just being mindful of what that might be and how to mitigate any negative uh, outcomes or unintended consequences. So some things we know. Um, the community will uh, effectively mobilise as first responders. Um, they are there on the ground and they will be doing things um, straight away, um, immediately, you know, in the, in, in before the disaster impacts and, and certainly after it occurs. So um, we need to be able to get some sense of, of planning for that, even if we don't know exactly who or exactly what, we can recognise that something will happen uh, and that we can build on the work of, of our first responders. There is an overwhelming need for information and access. I've never worked with a recovering community who said, we know too much, you know, we've, we've been told too much information. There's, there can't be enough information provided in enough different ways to satisfy the needs of everyone. So communicate um, as often and as creatively and as uh, succinctly as you can. Um, for repeat your messages and make sure that people can access the information they need. People will spontaneously volunteer and they will donate stuff. Um, and that happens after every disaster, and yet we are almost always surprised by it. So it's time for us not to be surprised by spontaneous volunteering and donating goods, um, but actually to get ahead of game and plan for that to happen. Um, we don't need to know where the goods are going to come to or who's going to bring them, but we can start to plan for when things turn up, how will we manage those, how will we distribute them, who will um, take carriage of that. There are, according to the research, there are recovery peaks. So we can expect an increase in activity around recovery at three days, three weeks, three, six and 12 months. Now many of our fire affected communities um, are in the sort of six to eight months, six to nine months period right now. And so this is particularly relevant. Um, one of the things that we common commonly find uh, in disaster recovery is that there is a a surge of people connecting with recovery services for the first time at the six month mark. And we are seeing that um, uh, at, at, the, at the current time. So, so people who have battled along and done the best they could to manage and have told themselves that they'll be okay and it'll all work out. And, and they do that for you know the first six months after the disaster. And then there's this realization that they're going to need a bit of extra help to, to, to get through. So, so we can predict these um, peaks, we can plan for them. 12 months obviously is a very important time uh, in disaster recovery because we're approaching the first anniversary of the disaster. Um, and for uh, disasters like cyclones or fires or uh, floods, we're also into the weather season that might see a return of, the, of that sort of an event. So, so that can be a really highly stressful time for people as well. Um, connection underpins resilience. Now, if you're going to plan for a disaster, I'd suggest leave COVID-19 out of it because 
it's not really helping, you know, it's, it's really making the job so much more difficult. And it's almost completely um, a complete antithesis um, to what we would recommend for recovering communities, which is to get together and have events and talk to each other and support each other in a, you know, in a sort of a, a collective way, um, be in the one space, check in on people. So we're having to be really much more creative in the way that we support recovery now. And we're going to learn a lot of new and important lessons through the work that's currently happening. Um, but know that it's really difficult to be resilient if you're completely isolated. So connection underpins resilience, even if it is via Zoom or on the phone, you know, or emails, just making sure that people know that there are people who know about them, care about what's happening for them and, and want to be connected to them through, you know, through this really difficult stage. And that probably brings us to a really interesting question that Zoe from Eurobadella Shire Councils asked in, in terms of how do you enable community capacity to rebuild in the current COVID environment? But I think you've captured it as just is trying to enable that connection. Yeah, I think recognising what underpins, you know, community capacity. So, and part of that is actually recognising that people are able to do things for themselves and, and, and should be supported to do the things they can do. Now, I want to be really careful about sort of inferring, it's like, well, they've got capacity, they'll be fine. It's not that, but it is actually saying, is there something that is working for you now um, that we can help with? Are there things that aren't working that we need to actually help, you know, help to provide? It's, it's being a bit more nuanced in terms of the assumptions we make about what will be useful. You know, um, turning up with our solutions before we even know the nature of the problem. You know, I think that's really what, what I'm talking about. But um, we're all of us learning on our feet um, about how to do this in these extraordinary times. And so there's not too many easy answers. I suspect, you know, 12 or 18 months from now, there'll be an absolute flurry of um, master's um, theses and PhDs around you know, just this topic. But for us in the moment, we're blazing the trail because we're actually doing the work um, in these very changed circumstances. So uh, it's a bit of a, um, a learn as we go. Now, I want to just note that there are different criteria for success. And this is a bit of an awkward conversation that we probably need to have. And that is sometimes this, the, the community's um, success, what they would con consider to be a successful or a positive outcome for recovery, can be at odds with um, the success measures for agencies, for government, for media, for politicians. You know, so when we talk about what are we trying to achieve, we really do need quite a joined up conversation that, that would enable us to get to a shared vision for success because otherwise we might all be out in the field doing the job and not really understanding that we're all doing a slightly different job, that we haven't worked out what that shared goal uh, and success for recovery might be. Um, needs and priorities evolve over time. Um, so many people I've worked with in, in disaster affected communities have said what we thought we needed in the first three weeks turned out to be very different from what we actually ended up needing in the first three months. And if we were to go back to them, you know, three years time, there would probably be different needs again, because um, it's not a static experience as different aspects of the disaster unfold. So the needs and priorities will change. So um, don't consider that, um, you know, it, it's an indication of a bad job. If it feels like you can't ever really get on, on firm ground to know what it is that's going to matter at any given time because what matters today might be different to, to what matters um, tomorrow. Um, so we need to maintain a, a high degree of flexibility, adaptability and really respecting local knowledge and experience about what the needs are and what the priorities um, therefore should be. And the whole, the whole gig takes so much longer than we think it will. Um, it's it's a, a really, really long ranging experience um, and one that will be complex and that will change uh, as people move through it. So a bit of an idea, I guess, a bit of a definition and go at pinning down this concept of community continuity uh, as a way to um, support community-led recovery. So protecting and reconnecting the threads of community 
to facilitate recovery and resilience. Going back to what was happening before the disaster and trying to bring that through uh, and support its re-establishment and, um, uh, and its reconnection in the recovery, uh, in the recovery phase. So that's, that's um, all that I wanted to talk about, particularly, specifically on the things that I wanted to be able to cover. But I'm hoping that there's some, that, that that's, some of that's raised some questions for you um, and that we could have a chat about some of those things now, Jamie. Yeah, that sounds great, Anne. I think we've got a number of questions come through. Um, you know, COVID-19 has obviously had a huge impact on the work that our uh, teams are doing. Yeah. And I suspect um, they're probably going to have some more questions come through, but bear with me just a moment while I get that up. So Peter's asked, um, if we go back to the different phases for individuals and communities um, and how they might experience, what they might experience post-disaster, yeah. Peter asks, how do we think that, the, that COVID might actually impact that curve? And and, and how do we notice our own place on the curve as recovery officers? Yeah, my sense is it will, it will open the curve up. So it's not necessary, I don't think it's necessary for us to say that, it, that it's going to be much, the experience is going to be much worse because of COVID. Um, there may be different aspects of it that resonate in different ways. But I think what we can expect is that everything is going to take a bit longer. Um, because rebuilding is compounded by COVID, um, you know, being able to meet with your insurance assessor, all of the things that the practical considerations of, of, of recovery, I think, are um, in some way um, likely to be challenged or exacerbated by the complexities of COVID. Um, so uh, I think, um, again, I think people are still going to need the same sorts of things. Um, there, there is still the sort of need for people to be able to be informed about what's happening, um, kept, you know, kept abreast of changes in, in um, grants or, or processes or support or whatever. Um, they're going to need to know that people care about what's occurred and, and that they're you know, interested in, in their recovery and, and supporting that. Um, the fundamental needs of recovery and what helps people to re regain control of their lives, I think, hasn't changed. But the environment that we're in, within which we're trying to deliver that has changed exponentially. So, so I think we need to think about well, what mattered um, to our work in recovery before, and how do we restructure those um, efforts so that we can continue to make the, them available in some way. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be a defining period for for the work of, of disaster recovery. Yeah, you're so right there, Anne. Um, it also, David's just made a comment here around uh, the need to build the skills and practice of being collaborative and working well together, such as um, he talks of the art of hosting practice. Um, and many people, uh, Peter also makes the comment that they've found online circles to be quite effective with groups. Um, he mm -hmm. wondered, have you experienced using these with affected communities to enable connection, sharing story and developing understanding for next steps? Um, I think there, there are, there's lots of, of platforms and lots of approaches that we, that we can use. Uh, and I think they all have their, um, their challenges, but also their benefits. Um, I think that the point um, being made there, though, is a really important one. And that is, we don't, we don't automatically wake up in the morning and find ourselves being good at this stuff. You know, it actually takes work. We have to be quite purposeful um, in order to work well together. Um, and again, it's around some of that um, shared um, goal setting, understanding of limitations and capacity. You know, um, I'm doing some work uh, in the recovery community at the moment and, and the agencies that came to support this community, um, one of the key things that stood out for them was how hard it was to actually work together. Um, they all wanted to work together. They all recognised that that was something they absolutely needed to be able to do. But there was just this huge challenge in terms of being able to know where each other fitted into the system. So that's something that we can get much better at long before a disaster occurs. And there are benefits in doing that, even though, um, even if a disaster never happens, the more connected agencies and organisations are, the more effective they are, are at working together and collaborating, um, the, you know, the better everything, everyone is going to be. So, um, I, that's why I think that uh, a collaborative approach to developing those profiles and to building the, the detail in those, um, speaking to organisations, 
in advance. What are you going to be doing if there's a disaster? What do we do? How does that fit together? You know, these are all things that we can spend time um, uh, doing to good effect uh, before we need them. Even if we haven't, though, we can quickly work out who we should be collaborating with and then to, you know, to use those tools that support that to happen in this, um, you know, in, in this time. And you spoke earlier of the idea that um, with all good intentions, sometimes state and local governments um, want to recover communities, which we know is, is not community-led recovery. Um, but Margaret asks the questions, do you have any thoughts about how the different levels of government and sectors can actually work more effectively together around coordinating and inter integrating more effectively so that the community benefits more quickly from the external support? And just curiously at the second point, any reflections on how we will need to do this now and what we might need to change? change to do better? Um, I think we are plagued by assumptions, you know, in, in recovery. Um, and, and that's okay because we can't all know everything. You can't know what you don't know, you know. So, so I think um, we've seen sort of in, uh, in recent times with, the, um, with the, the significant bushfires, we've seen lots of people, um, you know, being um, recruited into the space of, of recovery. Um, and all of them come with a, a particular perception or an expectation or an assumption because that's how we operate as human beings. You know, we have to formulate some idea of what this is going to be like or what's needed. Uh, and then we go and we try and fit that with the reality. Um, I think we can do a lot better at dispelling some of the myths and, and you know, really informing some of those assumptions in government um, so that um, uh, we don't see them coming in and imposing um, certain approaches or, or priorities or structures onto communities. Um, if we were able to, in, to um, develop a, a much better understanding of, uh, and, and a more honest, I guess, um, pragmatic um, connection with what it is we need as agencies in disasters, what we need to have happen, then we might actually have a bit better um, opportunity to support communities to do and get what they need. Um, but at the moment, I think we sometimes conflate those to being the same things and, and often they're not. So, so we really do have to work out um, what the priorities are for state government, for local government um, and for community and to find the common ground where those things intersect. Um, we can't, um, as I said uh, previously, we can't uh, advocate for um, community-led recovery if we don't want to let go of the reins. You know, you, you can't have it all. Like you can't have a neat, tidy, predictable, tied up with a ribbon recovery um, where no one's allowed to step outside of the, of, the, of the lines and then say, but we're aspiring for the community to lead. You know, so, so there has to be some, you know, some pragmatism and, and honesty around that. Um, uh, I think if we could find the answer to that question, though, we would sort of, we'd be moving on to world peace because, um, because we can't even predict the level of experience that people who might end up working in recovery uh, need to have or, or, or can have. So, so it's, a very, um, it's a very evolutionary space. Uh, and I think we do need to start to, um, you know, we, we talk a big game in Australia about community-led recovery. You know, oh, well, it's community, it's one of the national principles. But when you ask people, what does it look like? How would I know if I was looking at it? Um, why is it better than some other version of recovery? That's a much harder to define. And so I think we have to demystify. And that's really the attempt with community continuity is to try and overlay this fairly abstract idea with something that's perhaps a little bit more concrete. And that is getting ready for the bad thing before the bad thing happens and knowing how you'll actually move through the experience. So, yeah. Um, and in terms of getting better, I just love unlikely conversations. You know, I think we, we improve our um, effectiveness when unlikely partners get to talk to each other. Um, and so at the community level, that might be, you know, a, a planning conversation that includes the kinder teacher with the fire captain. You know, it's like, okay, suddenly you guys know a whole lot more about community resilience because you've got insights into each other's area of focus. The kinder teacher now knows a bit more about what happens, you know, in the fire shed and hopefully the fire captain has a bit more of an insight about some of the challenges and opportunities 
um, that exist in the kinder. So, so that's really how we we improve and um, uh, are able to you know enhance community resilience. Um, the trouble is that um, we don't always recognise the value in those sort of formal and informal formal opportunities to contribute and and uh, collaborate. So, um, I think that until we do, um, we are going to struggle to. Um, you know, not to not to take that sort of top-down approach because we don't actually understand what's happening uh, at the at the coal face, and we've just come in with what we think will work, um, and that's always going to be you know less than ideal. Thanks, Heaps, Anne. Another question that's come through regarding some: uh, Do you sometimes find a dominant voice um, in a recovering community can have a negative impact on others in that community? Example: A community leader calling for a fast cleanup or rebuilding, even though we know that individuals need to take their own time on that journey. And what what could um, we do as local government workers? What can we do to actually moderate that? Yeah, that's a really um, interesting challenge because. Quite often there's just this little bit of a vacuum that happens in sort of the community um, governance uh, after a disaster and into that vacuum lots of people can step you know and 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 the people who step in may or may not be representative of the broader community so that's you know that that legitimate question of legitimate representation is something that's really worth grappling with um, uh, because if you end up listening to and responding to the wrong voices or the, the not the wrong voices but the less representative voices in the community recovery can go in a particular direction which the bulk of the community um, don't actually recognize or value so so you can be striving to deliver things that you know people are going to be scratching their head and saying why are you doing that you know so so um, that's why I think having that community profile um, information available and making it as as sort of nuanced as possible and, and as detailed as possible. Um, the, the patterns of, of community leadership are able to be recognised and, and they exist within all communities. Um, we might not love them, but they make sense to the people for whom they matter. You know, so, so perhaps some communities might have you know, a much uh, more connected, collaborative style of working together. Other people will have a different structure. But whatever the structure is, it made sense to people the day before the disaster. So that's really our starting point, um, is to look at who was doing what, um, with whom, you know, in the time before the disaster occurred. And is that the pattern that we need to try and, and support and re-establish? Um, uh, what we don't want to do is say, well, everything's, everything's um, off the table now because a disaster has occurred. So we'll just start building this new structure with these new people, you know, who met the Premier's helicopter. So they are now the spokespeople. You know, it, we can we can do things like that in recovery, well intentioned, but really missing misinformed um, efforts to try and build a structure. And and after a little while, the community will look at it and say, well, we don't even know who those people are, and they don't speak for us. Um, so yeah, being careful about who. Who are you hearing from? So who is being heard? But importantly, who is not being heard? Where are, what are the missing voices based on our understanding of the community and our, and our profile um, uh, of that community? So coming back down to the community profile, Susie asks, is there actually a best time to develop that community profile with the community after a disaster? Is there? Yeah, um, I think the best time is, is yesterday, you know, and the next best time is today. So I think, I think wherever you are in the kind of, in that, in that cycle of, of emergency management, I think, I'm probably not the most unbiased commentator, but I think there's benefits in, in understanding the community better. Um, and, you know, I've had occasion to be filling out my template in the taxi on the way to the airport. Like if that's all you can do, that's better than coming in with no understanding at all. But a much better idea is to think about um, the relationship between connection, preparedness, capacity, resilience, you know, like being able to think about where do we jump into this system um, and what do we need to be doing at that point. So if it's about preparedness, then there's a great opportunity to develop community profiles with the community in a preparedness, um, as a preparedness activity, as an engagement activity. Come and help us understand how your community works. You know, come and talk to us about what you value and what your 
proud of, you know, you struggle with. And, and so building that sort of information with the community can be really a great way to go. But it's not always possible. And sometimes the disaster happens before you get the chance to do that. So then you're doing it in recovery. Help us understand how this community worked before the fire or before the flood. What were the things that mattered to you then? Do those things still matter now? Are there new things that matter? How do we understand those? You know, so, so I don't think it matters really where we do it, but what we need to be able to do is, is take that leadership and learn from the community at whatever point they are. Um, and so I think it's never a bad time, can I say, never a bad time to do it, but there's probably some points in time that are easier and better to do than others. Um, and again, we have to do it in a respectful way. We don't want to go to a community that's clamouring for, you know, for um, food, water and shelter and say, we're here to do a community profile. You know, you, you're not going to get any joy. Um, it has to be, um, you know, targeted at a point in time where the community has capacity to engage with the conversation. And again, even if, 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 if all that is possible is that you sit with your colleagues and maybe some of your other key stakeholders and you put a community profile together in order to get the work done, then there's an opportunity to go back to the community at some point in the future and say, look, this is what we thought we understood, but now we understand all these other things and we're also keen to know what you understand so that we can build a much more um, uh, comprehensive picture going forward. And perhaps with that comprehensive picture, if the, uh, if the community understands where they stand, um, it could probably leads a little bit into David's question around, interested in your thoughts on working with those NGOs or individuals who come to save the day and end up actually causing rifts and more con uh, conflict in communities. Just interested on your thoughts there, Anne. Yeah. Um, there, there is an inherent tension in recovery um, about how we engage and connect with community capacity. Because the, the brutal truth for many of us who are involved in recovery is that we actually need to have um, disaster victims as a, as a system input, you know, to our business model, if you like. You know, if we are an NGO that's, um, that's engaged with supporting people in disaster recovery, then we need for people who've been, we need people who've been affected by the disaster. In the same way that a dairy farmer needs cows um, and feed um, in order to produce milk, we need disaster affected communities and people impacted by disaster in order to deliver recovery. So we need to be really honest about that because that doesn't really fit comfortably with this picture of a community that's doing things for itself and doesn't need our help thank you very much you know so so we really need to find a way to evolve our practice um to um understand that that the things that we're charged and responsible for delivering or providing may or may not be needed by the community we're working with they may need different things um and that that doesn't reflect on the value of what we're doing it actually provides an opportunity for us to do this work differently. Um, we, act, we have to be really um, honest about our own KPIs and success measures. You know, um, uh, if we're, oh, the community still needed us four years after the disaster and we couldn't pack up and we couldn't leave. Well, is that a measure of success or is that a measure of having created uh, a level of dependence on our service that might make us feel good, but might actually have been quite detrimental to the you know independent um, and effective functioning of the community so so there's, there's time for some really brave and um, an honest sort of soul searching about our business models if we're really going to support community um, communities to lead their own recovery then we have to create a space within our respective models for that to be um, able to be supported and to flourish and that might actually be quite challenging to some of the traditional ways that we understand our work and our role. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Anne. Just, you mentioned community leadership has been critical. Um, and what do you find are the attributes of good leaders that you can see as valuable in this recovery context? Yeah, I think um, good community leaders are, are often the quiet people. You know, and, and so we have to be quite nuanced in our, in our assessment and our understanding of, of who might actually have leadership um, 
capability and, and potential um, and, and who the community might regard as their, their legitimate local leaders because very often, um, and I tell this anecdote because hopefully it does make sense and I've alluded to it before, but I've been in communities where um, the local leaders have been identified as the people who meet the Premier's helicopter when he or she lands at the footy oval. And there will be a group of people who are often quite vocal, quite politically connected, very unhappy about what's happened and what is happening in recovery. Um, and, you know, you can see the temptation for someone in authority to step down and be confronted by this group of people and go, OK, you must be the spokespeople for this community. Um, and when I ask the question uh, of people who know about recovery, are those people the local leaders? I invariably people say, no, they're not. And I say, where are the local leaders when the Premier's helicopter arrives? And where are they? They're actually out doing the work of recovery. They don't have time to meet the Premier at the, at the footy oval because they're actually outsourcing the stock feed, managing the donated goods, you know, helping to clear up the liquefaction, whatever it might be that's going on. So, so if we make the mistake of um, assuming that the people who are most vocal are automatically the local leaders, we're going to perhaps end up in a place we don't want to be. Um, and that's why the more effective we are at understanding the community functioning before the disaster, the more chance we have of actually being able to identify those legitimate local leaders that the community um, respects and, and the people who make sense to that community um, in a leadership role. Um, it doesn't mean there won't be emerging leaders. So we do need to be mindful of that and, and open to that as well. But we don't want to just engage with emerging leaders at the expense of everything that went before, because often those people need time and experience to grow into that leadership role. Um, so we really need to look at those characteristics of being um, thoughtful, um, being able to be representative, not being sort of fixated on perhaps a, a, a single issue, um, being able to consider things from different points of view, um, having a, a level of, of of patience and, and pragmatism, being able to operate in a sort of a chaotic environment and not wanting everything to be tidy and, and packed away, you know, so just, just able to, um, to, to, to roll with the with experience, to go with the flow as it were. Um, every community has leaders. That's almost um, a definition of the function of, of or, or the structure of community. Um, it's our job to find out who they are and what they're good at and what the gaps might be. And then we look to fill the gaps, not to kind of come in over the top and impose, you know, an artificial leadership um, structure or model. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Anne. Um, in Zoe's community of uh, Yurubadella, some people are beginning to talk about the first anniversary. Do you know of any examples or ideas of projects that have worked well elsewhere that can be shared in terms of possible options for their communities? Um, the, the first anniversary um, is a really significant time, I think, in, in my experience. I have, well, I have to admit and confess here, um, after our fires, I was um, rather impatient about the whole concept of the first anniversary, I have to say. Um, pretty feral. Um, just, oh, for goodness sake, it's just another day. Why will this day be any different? To, you know, and that sort of, you know, that, that kind of gives you an insight into where I was in my head at the time. Um, and then the first anniversary came and I was really knocked for a six because um, it was a very significant day. And I remember standing where I had been standing and, you know, and feeling the wind as it, I'd felt at that. You know, it just, it, it absolutely transported me back to that moment um, of, the, of the impact of the fires. And so I learned a really hard but valuable lesson about the importance and the significance of these milestone dates. Um, and for some people, it's the anniversary of the impact. For other people, it might be the anniversary of, um, you know, some other co subsequent uh, aspect of the disaster. Um, but anniversaries and, and milestones really matter because they mark our progress through this experience. Um, and very often, um, the first anniversary um, is the first time people will actually stop and reflect about all that they have um, experienced in that in that preceding 12 months, how much their life has changed. You know, that old, this time last year we were, you know, so, so I think we have to be really mindful that anniversaries are, are very important 
part of the of the healing and recovering process. Um, and for that reason, they need to be be supported and um, and dealt with in a sensitive and um, um, and you know a reflective way. We, we don't want to be too you know it's like um, sometimes you see things uh, being organized and offered and they just miss the mark and and you sort of wonder whether that hasn't made everyone just feel that little bit worse about their experience rather than feeling confident and supported as was intended so so i think um the best way to, to to do it is to talk to people um to actually get that community input what do we think would be a good way to mark this um you know this this important milestone are there things that we would want to see happen um, generally speaking, I think lots of people like to have a reflective process, so it's something that encourages them to maybe think about and, and express what this uh, experience has meant for them. So we see things like, um, you know, people um, writing stories or poetry or making wishes or, you know, things that, that, that enable people to express what they're carrying, you know, in their hearts at that time. Um, there's any example of, um, of different... Um, projects, um, art projects, you know, community um, events, etc. that that can be um, that can be considered. Um, but the main thing is um, to understand that it will mean different things for different people. Um, and so it's not it's not an event just to mark the experience of people, for example, who've lost their homes. It's also a time to mark the experiences of those who didn't lose their homes or who lost other aspects of their life, or maybe didn't lose anything physically, but have been really caught up in, in all the, the, the disaster has meant. It's a time to acknowledge the work of, of first responders, of people who've helped in recovery. Um, it's time to reflect on you know, the loss of pets and animals. And, you know, so so there's, awful, there's an awful lot of complexity around what these sorts of um, events and projects need to encapture, uh, encapsulate. So <clears throat> I think, um, yeah, I think having some conversations so that you don't leave people behind. And there will be other people who say, like me, I don't want to know about it. You know, um, I don't want to be reminded of the fact that it's been 12 months since we had the fire or the, you know, the flood. Um, and so there needs to be some capacity to represent their needs and wishes as well. So, yeah, um, the full gamut. Thanks heaps, Anne. Now we've spoken a lot about um, beginning recovery in those initial stages, but Anne, uh, sorry, Sam asks the question, um, interested in exit strategies, particularly when external agencies are involved in recovery efforts, uh, what would be good strategies to ensure community continuity after they leave? That's a great question and, and you know the time to plan transition is at the beginning, um, which is often not what we do. We start a process or a project or a service and then at some point we think, well, we're going to have to pack this up at some stage, but it would be really great if we were considering um, transition to you know, normal community functioning right from the outset um, to the point where I would almost say, if you don't know how something's going to end, maybe don't start it. Because if you haven't thought that through, then the likelihood of it ending badly is quite high. Um, so really thinking um, deeply and, and strategically about if we start doing this now, whatever it is, if this service starts or this program starts or we you know, deliver this in this way, um, what does the end look like? So starting with the end in mind and working backwards from there. Um, it doesn't mean that that won't change. So you don't have to have a crystal ball. You don't have to commit to absolutely on the 1st of May, you know, 2021, this is going to be the situation. But you do need to have an idea of what... Um, uh, being ready to transition will look like. So what are the key indicators that, that this service or program isn't needed anymore? Um, if we finish it up, what are the potential gaps that could open up? How do, we, um, how do we take care of those gaps and prevent them from being sort of the second disaster? Because the thing we need to understand about disasters more generally is that, is that they represent a massive amount of change. And so, and when human beings are not terribly comfortable as a rule with change, we like things to sort of be pretty stable and, and predictable. So, so when we um, start providing services and programs in the post-disaster setting, their um, invention represents change, 
and then their um, transition is representing more change. So, so even though the community might in fact recognise that it really doesn't need that particular program or service anymore, the ending of it will still represent a change in the in the dynamics of the of the community. So, so managing change management is really what we're talking about. It's not to say that we have to keep doing everything forever, but we actually need to manage the end of the programs as um, proactively as we manage their inception. You know, don't let things just, you know, wilt away and or, or just, you know, tailor off. We need to actually recognise what the end of the service or program will represent and how we make sure that gaps don't open up at that point. So planning really um, uh, proactively and effectively for that. Thanks heaps Anne and that probably brings us to a nice close of today's session and um, we've had a lot of people have to leave because of the nature of um, commit other commitments but they've obviously said a lot of thank you for the fantastic session. Um, with that in mind I just wanted to thank everyone so much for joining us for our webinar. We hope you have enjoyed today's session and obviously a special thanks to our wonderful guest Anne. Just a reminder that this webinar was recorded and we will send you a link to the recording. All the resources mentioned in today's session as well as a survey just seeking your feedback to help us uh, improve our delivery and our content. Now if you are on LinkedIn I would encourage you to join us at the Disaster Recovery Practitioners Australia group to continue the conversation. The purpose of this group is to share information about the practice of disaster recovery for community members, local governments, local organisations, schools, businesses, among others. There are many people who are going to, go through, uh, going to face being a recovery manager for the very first time, even if disaster recovery is nowhere near their job title. Uh, also, Australian Red Cross uh, runs the Disaster Recovery Advisors and Mentors Australia program, which is aimed at supporting communities impacted by disasters to drive their own recovery. So what we do is we link trained volunteer mentors, mentors like our wonderful Anne Leadbeater, who have previous personal experience in disaster recovery with community leaders. Um, so you may be a recovery officer, school principal, from local council or a community service organisation, and you're currently in the midst of the recovery, and we connect those with mentors to discuss and address the challenges posed by the disaster recovery process. Now, the, the mentoring aims to help normalise community, uh, help community leaders avoid unnecessary pitfalls in recovery, also help normalise the recovery experience, but equally just to share their experiences, provide support and act as a bit of a sounding board. So if you are interested for further information on that program, please email us at recovery at redcross.org.au. This was one of a series of webinars supporting the sector, so please keep an eye on the Red Cross website for upcoming webinars. Thank you again for joining us, and until next webinar, thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you.